Rich is going to talk about allocating the transaction price. Rich? Okay, thanks, Brian. And as you mentioned, we're going to take that price now that Brian just talked about and allocate it to the performance obligations from back in step two. Um, now to do that allocation, you're going to use a, a relative standalone selling price model. And for the most part, that's pretty consistent with the allocation approach that exists in the multiple element guidance in existing GAAP today, and that they're, they're both uh, relative standalone selling price approaches. So step one, um, you're going to estimate the standalone selling price of each performance obligation. And then in step two, what you're going to do is determine if there's any discounts or any variable consideration that you don't want to allocate to all of the performance obligations. And, and that is different from the existing model where you know, under the existing model, most likely you're going to allocate any discount, for instance, on a, a pro rata basis across all the deliverables. Um, and then at the, the final step is to actually allocate the transaction price. Now, um, what's the standalone selling price? Well, it's the amount that the entity charges or would charge when, the, when they sell the, the goods or services on their own to a customer. So you make this determination only at contract inception. Now, in existing GAAP under 605, um, you've got this general multiple element arrangement model, and you have a three-level hierarchy, um, and you use that to identify the standalone selling price. So you start with vendor-specific objective evidence, or VSO, of selling price. And if you have that, you have to use it. Um, if you don't have it, then you use third-party evidence of selling price, if, if you've got that. You know, what is the competitor selling a substantially similar product or service for? Um, so, again, if you have third-party evidence, you've got to use that. But if you don't have either vendor-specific objective evidence or third-party evidence, then you use the, uh, the best estimate of selling price. Um, so what ASC 606 does is that establishes a, a two-level hierarchy. Um, there's a directly observable price that gets charged by the entity in similar situations, similar to VSO, and then you have an estimate of the standalone selling price. Now, there are three approaches discussed in the ASU on how to estimate a standalone selling price. Um, listed here on the slide, the adjusted market assessment approach. This approach focuses on the amount that the entity thinks it can get uh, for the good or service in the market where they're going to sell the good or service. So, for example, the company might look to competitor pricing for uh, similar goods and services, and, and then they would adjust those prices to reflect the company's costs and, and margins. Um, it, it's probably, this approach is probably going to be easiest to use when the, the company has sold the good or services for a respectable period of time or when there's a competitor out there that's selling a, a similar good or services. But if you're selling an entirely new good or service, it's not going to be as easy to apply this model. Um, the next one, the expected cost plus margin approach, that puts more emphasis on internal factors but it still does consider external factors. So you start out with cost, you add your desired margin, but you probably have to adjust the price that you determine if you assume a 25% desired margin and that results in a price that's going to exceed the market price that competitors are charging for similar goods and services. Um, so again, th this approach is gonna be um, useful in a lot of situations, uh, particularly in situations where you've got like a, a determined direct fulfillment cost, like a, a tangible product, or, or maybe you've got like a, an hourly service or something like that that you're providing. But it's going to be less helpful when there's no, um, when, the, when you don't have that clear direct fulfillment cost or um, the amount of the cost is unknown, like a, a new software license or specified upgrade rights or things like that. And the third item is the residual approach. And under 606, this residual approach can be used in in limited circumstances to, uh, to estimate a standalone selling price. So you'd only use it when you've got a contract that has multiple promised goods or services and, and the selling price of one or more of the goods or services is, is not known, either because you've got the historical selling price, you have it, but it, it's highly variable, or maybe you just don't have it. The, the goods or services haven't been sold yet. And then you've got observable selling prices for the other performance obligations. And um, so what you would do in those situations, you take the observable selling prices for those performance obligations that you have and allocate, you know, that, that would be the standalone selling price for those items. And then whatever's left over from the total transaction price or the quote-unquote residual, that's what you'd allocate to um, the 
the item with the unknown price. And a, a common example here would be software. So if you've got something like an entity that sells, for instance, software, services, and maintenance together, and the prices vary widely in that they also sell the, the services and maintenance individually, and, and those prices are relatively stable. Um, in that situation, you would use the residual approach to determine the standalone selling price of the software obligation. Um, now it, this residual approach, just for the people who are listening on the software industry, um, it's different from the residual approach that exists in the software guidance today because the, the software, the existing software residual approach, that's used to actually allocate the consideration. The 606 residual approach, that's used to determine the standalone selling price. Then it's used to, to allocate. Um, there is a practical alternative down at the bottom of the slide here related to estimating the price of options. Um, it can be used when the option provides a material right to get future goods or services, and those future goods or services are both similar to the original goods or services in the um, overall contract, and they're provided in accordance with the terms of the original contract. Now, if you apply this practical alternative, it essentially it results in allocating the transaction price to the, the those optional goods or services that are you expect to provide instead of allocating anything to the, the option itself. So it's a again a practical alternative does not need to be applied. Now the next thing to talk about is allocating discounts and variable consideration. And I, I mentioned up front there is a you know this this is one of the differences um in uh, 606 because, you know, generally speaking, you're going to allocate any discounts or variable consideration using this relative standalone selling price model, but the difference is that under certain circumstances, you're going to allocate the discount or the variable consideration to one or more but less than all of the performance obligations. And there are different criteria that have to be met, you know, in order to do that for a discount than to do it for a variable consideration. So. For discounts, you would allocate to fewer than all of the performance obligations if you've got an entity that regularly sells each distinct good or service in the contract on a standalone basis. They also regularly sell, um, again, on a standalone basis, a, a bundle of some of those distinct goods or services at a discount to the standalone selling prices. And then the discount that's attributable to that bundle um, is substantially the same as the overall discount in the overall contract. In that situation, you would, you know, so if you're selling A, B, and C, and there's a, an overall $100 discount on the arrangement, and A, you generally sell at list price, and B and C, you sell in a combination, in a bundle, with um, a discount of $100, you would allocate the entire $100 discount in the overall arrangement to B and C and allocate none of it to A. Now, for variable consideration, on the other hand, the criteria there are um, that the, the terms of the variable payment have to relate specifically to um, the, the entity's efforts to, uh, to satisfy that obligation or transfer the distinct good or service, and allocating the variable consideration entirely to a particular performance obligation or more than one performance obligation, that allocation is consistent with the, the overall allocation objective in 606.